of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. <laughs> you want an expository? You're, you're harmonizing the Gospels, so... <laughs> I'm not there yet. <laughs> I'll let Caleb talk first, and then I'll tell you the right answer. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure specifically which portion they're talking about. I have an idea. Um, and that is probably the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep or raised up would be my assumption as to what they're specifically talking about here. And... Um, this would be one of those passages that this is all we really have of it. And we don't, it's one of those, Jim probably knows, but I don't know. It's just one of those, we don't know, uh, passages as to uh, accept that it happened. And uh, who they are, we don't know. What their purpose was, we don't know. Um, and so, but they're, there are theories out there about it, but Scripture just doesn't seem to give us a clear answer on it. That's why I first say that I'm proud of Caleb for the answer, because uh, one of the ways, and I've said it many times here, whether you remember it or not, but I say it every time I teach at Carver when I open a class, is there are going to be times when I say, I don't know. And uh, for those students that I have at Carver that are going on to be pastors or, or teachers in their Sunday school, I said, you got to have a comfort level as a teacher with saying, I don't know. Because uh, if you make stuff up, then you're essentially adding or taking away from the Word of God, which uh, God's Word says has a specific curse tied to it uh, at the end of Revelation. And Caleb hit, hit it right on the head. This is the information we have. Matthew's the only one that mentions this. There's no contemporaneous writing from Josephus or anybody else that mentions it. So it was a, a specific miracle tied to the resurrection uh, that, uh, or tied to the crucifixion and maybe a foretaste of Christ's resurrection that uh, we don't have any more information about. So we've got to say, here's what we have to work with. God allowed people most likely that died recently. I've heard people use this as a, as a proof text for zombies. <laughs> and you get, you get you know, another Rogerism. He would always say it goes from the ridiculous to the sublime. And uh, this, this, you know, you get ridiculous things. And anybody that comes and has a definitive answer for this is pulling it out of their hat because we don't know. It was intended to be tied to the crucifixion, clearly, in the text. Uh, looking forward to the resurrection, clearly in the text. And what happened to those people? I've heard some people conjecture that they continued, like Lazarus, to live and died again. And then I've heard people say that they rose in their glorified they rose in their glorified bodies and ascended in heaven. But we just don't know. Uh, so it's one of the things we'll find out all the details about when we get to be with the Lord. But anybody that tells you they have a definitive answer on this is uh, it's just an opinion. And opinions can be really dangerous biblically if you don't have, uh, you know, the, the scripture to substantiate them. So, I wish I could give you more, but at the same time, I'm glad I don't, <laughs> because God didn't give us any more than that. This is what He gave us. I mean, there are other portions of the passage we understand. You know, right. the, the the veil was torn in two. The sacrificial system was over. Uh, it was it was all paid in full. And uh, so those, those issues we understand, uh, Christ gave himself, yielded up his spirit, but um, the verse that I assumed was the problematic passage was verse 50, 53, 52, where the saints are raised. If I were gonna add anything else to it, I would lean in my opinion that they were more like Lazarus and presumably they had died very recently and went and lived. And I only base that on, the problem I have with the glorified body thing is that Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. He hasn't raised yet. Uh, and so for what it's worth, I think they're probably more like Lazarus, but that's just my opinion. Yeah. Well, in my version, in 53, it does say after his resurrection. 
Oh, okay. Sorry about that. After his resurrection. So, so that would that would be yeah. You're right. That would be uh, then they could very well be. But again, we don't know. They then they very well could be in the resurrection. Well, it, no, no. It's, it says after his resurrection they entered into the city. So it's after Christ was resurrected they were still alive. So. They, I mean, they they, had, they hadn't gone away before. They were around for 40 days. I mean, not the resurrection, but the, yeah, they were around for at least three days. So. Yeah, and again, they it could be it could be either way. We just don't know. As far as whether they were in resurrected bodies or whether they were in their normal bodies. But you're but you're right. That's after his resurrection. Okay, next question. <clears throat> Why don't we have any crosses outside the church, on the building, or on the sign, etc., etc.? So basically, why do we only have a cross behind the pulpit, but nowhere else do we have it like on, on any of our stuff outside the church? Uh, we just don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's not purposeful to my knowledge. I don't ever remember. I, I do remember a bit about um, when we got the steeple because we didn't always have a steeple out there that I think we had some discussions, but I can't tell you any reasons why we went. I mean, based on our history, it was probably cheaper not to have it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember? I, I have a little insight why we have the cross above the baptistry. Is someone that used to go here found it. You know, when we built, when we built it, as we scrounged a lot, and someone come dragging that in, and, and <laughs> Roger was dead set against it because Roger, because where Roger comes from is he was raised Catholic, and so um, there was a lot of worship around crosses in the Catholic. They're, they're, they, they're idols. It was an idol to him. And but once it, he allowed it to be out there, I re he he realized it was beautiful, and it wasn't the object of worship. And I think that's to me. I spent a lot of time talking to people who are going to church here, and it, it was an idol thing for him. And that's and I think that's the only reason we don't have it is because it, it was an, it, it was offensive to to some people that came out of Catholic religion to see crucifixes and crosses. Because of what it meant that what it meant in that religion they came out of, but I, I know no other reason other than we're cheap. Frugal. Yeah, there's a difference between cheap and frugal. Yes. No, no. <laughs> Okay, next question. Um, I'm going to go ahead and have Caleb start on this one. You're both going to answer it. Oh, I started the last one. Okay, then we can go. No, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> Who has been the most influential person in your life? Jeff King. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the answer, it's Jeff King. He was my... He was, my, <laughs> he was my mentor, and uh, before I interned, well, I, it was kind of an internship, but it was like a, a working internship in the summers that I would, the, the church hired me for the summers in between college to, to keep up the grounds, to mow the grass, to, to just to do all the work around the church. and. Uh, many hours for just sit being in Jim's office and talking about spiritual things and questions and, and even before that in my teenage years it was just it's always been good. There are others, I mean my parents and, and uh, you know have great influence on my life but in, in, in the sense of where I'm at today it would be Jim. That's uh, humbling and scary. Uh, 
Oh, well, would, would be Roger, and I talk about Roger a lot, and it's, I think, very biblical, that progression of training up uh, one another, training up faithful men, um, and everything he said about me, I could say about Roger. You know, he was my mentor, he was uh, uh, another dad to me. Uh, so I can say now that he's gone on to be with the Lord. He was more like a grandpa to me because my grandpa's both passed away when I was really young, but he would be offended by that. <laughs> because there's only like, uh, there's only like 18 years apart between us. But, uh, but uh, he certainly stepped into that role of mentor and spiritual father. And uh, uh, I never cry, so... It would be really weird if I cried and you did. <laughs> I did, don't <laughs> So I won't say anymore. I, I say a lot about him as it is, though, so. But yeah, it would be rough. I mean, unless somebody has something they want to ask specifically. But I, I can't think of any area of life that Roger and I did not talk about at some point in the almost you know, uh, 45, almost 50 years that I knew him. I, I will, let me say re real quick that when I got out of Bible college, or when I was about to get out of Bible college, I had to do my internship with him, and he said, so today we're going to start deprogramming you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, what was one great thing about your week and one difficult thing about your week? <laughs> you can choose more than one. I was in the store with Titus uh, two days ago, yesterday, I don't know. I was pushing him in the car. And he looks up at me and he goes, Daddy, you're my best friend. Aww. And he's like, Oh, Titus, you're my best friend. <laughs> but then he said, Mommy, you're not my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> that was your worst part of the week. And it was my best part. It's probably because it was in Home Depot and they have those car carts. So then they just on, you know, I'm racing around all the aisles. And anybody else that is Titus and I are having so much fun. <laughs> uh, but also we had uh, we had a gathering um, last night at our house with several friends and it was just uh, it was a really refreshing great time and we could finally start doing that in our in our home as things are getting completed. And um, it just was, it was a really great experience. Excuse me, the second half. The one difficult thing. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if there's, you know, if it's a spiritual or physical or, or what in particular is the, the avenue here, but um, been remodeling the bathroom this week and it's been an absolute nightmare. But, um, I, everything that I did, I had to undo and then do it again, which it just kind of goes with a lot of construction stuff that I do. Um, and that was installing the floor and then putting in the toilet and then you know putting in tile and the tile wouldn't stay up and it was and it was falling down. We had to try everything different because it was wall tile and and uh, then. After you got all done with that, noticed that the toilet was not sealing properly, and water was going all over the floor, and you had to uninstall all that, and it was just this, it was this dreadful, dreadful process. And, you know, you think you can get something done, and then you have mortar and grout and all this stuff mixed up and ready to go, and then it ends up, you can't stop, because then that turns to concrete, which the Wilsons witnessed that as I carried a great big five-gallon bucket full of basically concrete, because it was, <laughs> it was drying, and... And uh, um, anyway, it was a it was a nightmare. And you, so you started after the kids go to bed, thinking I can get this done, and then it's two, three o'clock in the morning, like I can't do anymore. And it's, everything is exacerbated, and it's very, very frustrating. And trying on a marriage, and you're trying to do it together, and all those things. We were so, so good. <laughs> <laughs> 
but that was probably the worst part of my week. But. I don't know, that's hard. Um, because there are practical good yeah. things and practical spiritual things. And, or, I'm sorry, practical good things and spiritual good things and there are practical bad things. And, and usually the, the, the little lights have more to do with like what Caleb said, something went wrong. We had to go clean, we had to go winterize our camper this last couple days and we ended up another day down there because the electricity went off. <laughs> And, and so, this is the first time I've ever winterized a camper. I mean, we've been camping in trailers for years, but uh, Dad always took care of ours, and uh, we had a pop-up for a while, but there's nothing really to do on those. So, uh, my uncle was down with us and, and helped us get that done, but, uh, but it had some challenges. But, you know, in the light of everything that's going on in the world, and the light of people you know that are not receptive to the gospel, uh, it's, it's trivial stuff, and it's, it's frustrating when you look back and say, well, why was I so upset by that? Because there are much, much uh, greater things that are of eternal value that are much more upsetting. I, it's hard to choose from the, the high points. There's a lot of high points. Um, I think, you know, just, being here last Sunday and Wednesday and Tuesday night is always a high point. But I think that the birth of that baby in Uganda was my high point this week, especially when John was thoughtful enough to send those pictures out. And you get to see here's this baby that in, you know, a, a different time, uh, maybe even in the absence of, and John's going to come and talk to you about this mission trip next week, but in the absence of that mission, that medical mission, that that baby may not have survived because the baby was breech. And, um, you know, I think that's the high point. I think this, the, you probably will never meet them until we get to eternity because this, this lady came to know Christ during that medical mission and through that was able to get uh, to a hospital and have this, this cesarean that uh, probably saved certainly the baby's life and maybe saved her life too. And I, I think that it's hands down, that's probably the high, 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 high point. Uh, and it involves people you never met. <laughs> but uh, I think that's a, that was a great high point this week. And some of you are looking perplexed about what's going on. If you're not on the email list or you yeah, haven't been here on Wednesday nights, you're probably not aware of it. But uh, John Gray went on a mission trip. He's going to come and share about it next week, so he'll tell the tale. Then I won't relate it all here. But a baby was born successfully that may not have been. So, what are you guys learning from the word personally uh, and about yourself recently? And I will add one more thing on top of that. And what version of the Bible do you do your personal study out of? Um, well, one thing that I, you know, just nothing against the way you ask the question, but uh, anytime I'm in the Word of God, it's a personal study. Um, and I had, a, I had a strong conviction about that early on, uh, really in college. Um, where the teachers and professors would always say, don't forget, you need to make time for your personal devotions, too. And I'm like, every time I'm studying this, the Word in all these classes, that's, that's a personal devotion. It should definitely be, uh, definitely be that. <clears throat> so I know that's not what you meant by your question, but... Uh, so I, I, and I don't know why I use the New King James Version. I think that's just because I started using that, and... I have so many notes and things in my Bible that that's just the, the uh, preferred Bible that I use. It's not necessarily the preferred translation that I use, but this is the preferred Bible that I use. When I think of a passage, I know what side of the page it's on and about the proximity of where it's at, and so I can turn and flip there and go, there it is, um, because I'm, I'm used to this Bible. So to change all that would be problematic for me, I guess. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I'm a fan of the ESV, um, personally, but I don't use it that much. I do have a ESV study Bible that I read along with my uh, Bible to just 
because it's one of those newer ones, but I've been comparing it and I really enjoyed the preciseness of it. Um, there was a lot of questions. What was the first question? And what are you learning? Um, right now I've really been um, immersed myself in the Book of Romans. Uh, as I'm going to be starting the Book of Romans um, next week is the plan. Next Sunday morning I'll be starting the Book of Romans. And um, it's been a really awesome experience. And I don't want to share too much because then I don't know what I preach next week. So, um, but it's a it's a very powerful, wonderful book. It's a little daunting. The, some of the passages and things that I know that are in there, and I've been <laughs> already pre-studying some of them. And that's one of those things. One of the first questions I think you asked when we did this is how do you decide what you're going to what book you're going to do and so forth. And that was one of those battles and challenges that I had with the Lord, <laughs> uh, where okay, Romans no, not Romans. As there's this passage and that passage, and I don't want to do, do that, but um, I just had a real strong uh, conviction that I need to do it, and uh, it's been really great to study it. So, there was another question, too. I don't remember what it was. And what are you learning about yourself? Okay, you answer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, any time that you, you spend time... I thought you wanted me to tell you what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> what you should be learning about. <laughs> um, I, it's hard to, to go into that without going into specifics that you know, really is, is no one else is concerned with. It's just any time you're in the Word of God, that deep you realize how flawed you are and, and how much you need him and rely on him. And um, it's disappointing. <laughs> oh, wretched man that I am. Whose job delivered me from the body of this death? And, and um, what a wonderful God we serve that has saved us from that. And I'm grateful for it. <laughs> Okay, yeah, we're gonna go. Uh, what have you been learning from the Word and about yourself recently? Okay. Um, it, it sounds like the stock answer, but Caleb's right. You know, it, if you're in the Word, you're going to see your uh, how far short you fall. Uh, uh, God's mark and. And if you stay there, that's not what God intends, and it's a dangerous place to be because what it's supposed to do is certainly prompt you to uh, to practical righteousness, but it also should give you a renewed day after day appreciation for what Christ did for us and what God did for us in sending His Son. So yeah, I'm I'm reminded that I'm a jerk um, and that. Um, the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked above all else who can know it, even as believers, we still struggle with it. Why I call it Paul? Um, Caleb mentioned what Paul says in Romans, O wretched man that I am. Uh, when he talks about his own struggle with his, his sin, even as Paul, St. Paul, uh, you know, Paul is, was as uh, sinful and as flawed as, as you and I were, and he recognized it and wrote about it, and God kept it in the eternal record, so at least that I could do as pastor is also to, to say the same thing. I struggle uh, every day, and the uh, one of the main things that keeps you on track or points you to the right track is to be in God's Word. So, uh, you know, for the for the purposes of teaching and preaching, I'm in Acts, and I'm in Daniel, and I'm in John, and. Uh, <coughs> Tuesday nights has been a little bit different this year, and I think it's been really helpful. It's a little more topical as far as living the Christian life and all over the place in Scripture, which is a good thing. Personal reading, I just finished Deuteronomy, which uh, you know is one of those that I think people say, oh, what a hard book. Deuteronomy of, of the five <laughs> um, is really, our, I should say, a, a Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, I think, is a little easier to read because it's a 
reminder of what God's standard is for the Jews going into the promised land. And it's really a hopeful book in uh, a great many respects because God's preparing that whole new generation to go into uh, into the promised land. And I think that's something we can bring into day-to-day -day life is that we always have to be looking towards uh, what God has next and you know, holding our plans with an open hand, certainly, but but understanding that God has given us everything we need to go into uh, whatever new situation he has and that we have the added benefit of the Holy Spirit uh, that's going to lead us along if we if we walk in. Did that get all of them? Or? Oh, translation of the Bible. Um, I only read out of the Greek and Hebrew. <laughs> Occasionally the Latin. <laughs> no, I use I've used the New King James for a long time. Before that, I used the New American Standard for a long time. Before that, uh, I used the King James. And so, when you see me, it, it's funny. In high school, it was like went my last two years to Christian school, so you had to use the King James. And so, a lot of my memory work in. Uh, when I, was a young, when I was younger and in high school came from the King James. And so as I went to college, I changed to New American Standard. And as I got older, I changed to New King James. And so, you know, this is going to sound like an excuse, but when I get up there and try to quote scripture sometimes, it's a little muddled. Uh, it's, it's because when you learn things as a, a younger person, I think they're always there. And so my, my memory is always fighting Verses from the King James to the New King James, and I've had people correct me afterwards. Like, you quoted this like this, and I know. Uh, I apologize. Um, I used I used the ESV too. I think it's it's a, a pretty good translation. I my my translational standard is you, you can kind of chart out all the different translations on a graph to, from word for word translations to thought for thought translations and then all the way down to paraphrases, and I'd stay on the word-for-word -word translation end of the spectrum. So King James, New King James, ESV, New American Standard are, in my mind, some of the best translations. Interlinear is going to be the most word-for-word -word translation, which is going to be, means you've got the Greek and Hebrew, but then you've got a literal translation. But, but it's like when you try to speak Spanish or something, the words are all out of order and right because of the way they constructed the grammar. But, but I use a lot of, you know, we talk about online and internet, and there's certainly the dark side to all that. But I want to tell you, what, I am just for the sake of not having to pick the book up. I'm glad I don't have to get the strongest concordance out anymore <laughs> because it's a big book if you've ever used it. And so I use, uh, I think I mentioned before, a resource called Blue Letter Bible. There's a whole bunch of online resources to be able to look up words and then look at the language and, and uh, look at the Greek and the Hebrew. So that's, but for the most part, New King James. Can you guys speak on the importance of music that we sing in church? <clears throat> Um, we want the music that we seem to be founded in scripture and um, we have uh, ventured into some music that some people may consider new a lot of it's not new but um, it's just not in our hymnal and uh, even and some of it is new but there are some really rich doctrinal songs even in the new so it's not whether it's new or old, we sing both, but it's um, what is found in scripture, what is rich, but what is worship. Um, so many times I hear people say, well, this is my, this is the way I like to worship, this is my preference. Is that worship? Is worship about me? Is worship my preference? Or is worship glorifying God? And so we don't want anything that's going to distract from that. We want to glorify God. And if there's anything that would distract from that, we don't want it. And so um, 
we find that usually, for the most part, the older hymns are most rich in true doctrine. And so we tend to stick more with that. Um, but there's some new ones, and I'm thankful for Kels and Andy for, for incorporating those and bringing those in because there are some really rich hymns that we sing. We sang one last week, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone, My Fence Set Free. What a <coughs> wonderful song that is. And um, so, anyway, you can take the rest. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a big topic. I did a, a study on music uh, years ago here in, uh, when we had used to have Sunday school in the, well, we had two Sunday school classes. One was in the sanctuary, and, and uh, nobody left happy. <laughs> because there are bad hymns. And you know, nobody likes to say that if you're on the more traditional side, but there are just some really incredibly doctrinally bad hymns, uh, in, even in our hymn book. And because they become traditional, they're just there. And so uh, I think a lot of times the focus on uh, music gets, we're gonna attack the contemporary songs and not look at the, the, the problematic songs that are traditional. So it, it's, it's like anything else. It's all should be up for constant review and up for uh, holding up to this this standard here, the Word of God. And so in Ephesians and Colossians, both uh, are instructional in, in one the purposes of music is both personal, um, speaking to, to yourself in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, but also speaking to each other in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and it's in the context of teaching. And so there, the idea of, and this might, this may, may cross the line to people might be offended by, but the idea of mindless worship or just to get lost in the music is not a biblical concept. It's it, there's always a doctrinal component, uh, always an instructional component to uh, music in Scripture. The songbook of the Bible, the, the Psalms, is instructional. It's doctrinal. It's rich in doctrinal content and instructional content. Uh, so there's so there's there's some that, that goes all the way over here on the contemporary s spectrum that is just again it may, it may sound mean but it's mindless it's just well we're, we're gonna I you know famously and I think you were went to this we went to a, visit a college and uh, a Bible college with uh, several teenagers when I was youth pastor years ago and uh, the during the, the uh, one of the chapel services a guy gets up with the guitar and he says you know I really don't know. Uh, all the words to the song, but it's got a great beat to worship to. And it blew my mind um, because that's not biblical. Now, you can say, but, well, but that's, you're judgmental. Well, there are some things you're supposed to judge. Uh, okay, there's, we are supposed to discern. And uh, that it was disappointing. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we had years ago, uh, we got into the habit of putting some songs in the bulletin that weren't in our hymnal. Uh, and I put a song in one week, and I had a little lady that came up and said, I am tired of these <coughs> contemporary songs in our hymnal. It was Brethren We Had Met to Worship, which was written in the 19th century. I said, how old? I didn't say but I want to say, well, how old are you? If this is a contemporary song, how old are you? So we can go to the other extreme where anything new is bad. And on this side, anything old is bad. And it's not the case. You have to put everything under uh, the, the uh, scope of God's word and uh, see that it, it doesn't have to preach a message every time, but it, but it should affirm, reaffirm, or instruct in, uh, even if it's worshiping God, in proper worship of God, or reaffirm, uh, <clears throat> sound doctrine, uh, even those things, those hymns and songs that we sing that are about day-to-day -day life, it should encourage us in some way in, in, in sound doctrine. So I don't know if all that makes sense, but <clears throat> I know this is a big topic, so somebody's got to follow up there. Yeah, go ahead. Um, 
when I was church shopping, I'm fairly new to the area, so I went church shopping. And the one reason that drew me back to this church was because of the use of the handle. And, you know, most of the churches had bands and sang songs you did not ever heard before. But that's one re one reason why I came back to this church is because the hymn and the beautiful songs that are in What's that? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, Don't be afraid. To ask a question, because like, like I said, I know it's a big topic. I, I just want to tell you, guys, like, feel free if there's a hymn that you've noticed we don't see, or like, oh, I wish we would sing it. Like, feel free, feel free to ask. I, I think today we're singing "Have Faith in God." I had never heard of that song before, <laughs> but Jim asked, and so I that song it. got added in because Jim asked about it. Or like last week we sang "I Know Who Holds the Future." And that was in our old hymnal, and it was one, honestly, I had just forgotten about, but then Dean Poulter asked me about it, and so we added it back in. So feel free, if you're like, oh, I really wish we say it, feel free to ask. I will also say, I typed up every hymn for the, it is eye-opening to type, some of them, it's the ones we sung for a year, and I type it and go, what is that even mean? Like, right, you really do stop and think about it more, because I think you're right, it does kind of just become tradition, but we've always sung this. But I think it can become habit. You're not really thinking about what you're singing. Like. Yeah, and I do think that's a, I don't, want, I don't want to know if I want to say a problem, but there, there is a, a challenge with some of the old hymns that certainly we don't talk that way anymore. And there are words that get used in fain would I, uh, what is, I didn't think of the line, but it starts with fain. What does that mean? Fain would I, da, 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 you know. And, so then it's incumbent upon us to either look and see what does that mean. I'm glad Kelsey brought that up. If you see something in the hymn, uh, there's two challenges. Maybe if it's so antiquated, we have to look at it. But at the same time, we have, you have remarkable resources at your disposal to look up what does that word mean. Maybe it's an old word, but that doesn't mean that we need to get into the mentality of the world where we cancel everything we don't know or we're not comfortable with. Uh, I mean, we're in the process, the world's in the process of canceling Shakespeare. And maybe you say, oh good, I never liked Shakespeare. Uh, but you, you know, if you've ever taken the time to, to study uh, uh, some of the phrases, those everyday phrases that we use that came out of Shakespeare, you'd be, uh, you'd be surprised. Uh, there's, there's, they, they contribute a lot, and the same is true with hymnology. Uh, hymns contribute a lot, especially the good, solid doctrinal hymns contribute a lot to uh, just our the way we do things, the way we say things. Sometimes within the context of church, even churches that have thrown out the hymns, uh, the effect of, of what they had in the years prior is still there. But so, uh, yeah, take the time to look, and I appreciate Kelsey's offer. If you didn't hear that, you know, um, she said if you've got a hymn that we don't sing anymore that you want to, you'd like us to sing, we have to. That, that's one of the good things about having stuff on the wall. You can add things in that we don't have in our hymnal, and um, and so we can we can come back and bring even old hymns back, not just new stuff. We can bring old. Stuff. They brought for the conf one of the conferences uh, the Bible stands. That is one of my favorite hymns. It's never been in any of our hymnals. We've always, that's been one of those that we always had to add into the bulletin if we were gonna sing it. And when it popped up on the screen, I, the screen, I just about yelped. You know, yeah. That's my outdoor willingness. Uh, he's a rock star. No, he's not. Uh, anyway, take her up on that, Eleanor, then Dustin. Eleanor? Uh, one of my good friends suggested going through the hymnal as part of devotions because it's so doctrinal. Yeah, we, we've done some Sunday school classes on, you know, we, Jim and I would pick a hymn or two and we would go through and just show the richness of the doctrine in it. We've done it, especially on Christmas time, we'll pick a, a, a Christmas hymn and uh, they are, they're very rich in how they connect to different passages all throughout scripture. Very good. Yeah, as part of that music study I was talking about earlier that I did in Sunday school years ago, that's what we did. We talked about music and the biblical connections of music, but then we went through, I think, 20 hymns 
over the course of the quarter and looked at, and we had, there were hymns that people suggested they wanted to go through these hymns. But that's a, there, there are some devotionals, if you're interested in that, I'm trying to think of the guy's name, I think it's Osbeck. Ken Osbeck did uh, three or four books on the backgrounds of different hymns, and of course online you can find that stuff pretty readily. And I think he even did a devotional uh, I, I think that you could, it focused on a hymn a day uh, for a year, if I were, and I may be wrong on that, but I know he, he's done uh, several books that are really interesting to see how these hymns came about, both the uh, the lyricists as well as the composers of the music. And of course, some of the the tunes are tunes that have been taken out of uh, what would have that day been contemporary music and and uh, set to uh, biblical doctrine. So, you know, this isn't a new struggle. I, I this has always been. Uh, somebody, somebody has said before, well, I don't like these contemporary songs. And I, I said, you know, every song, every single song, every single hymn in the hymn book was contemporary at some point. There's nothing that came down from, uh, you know, God's presence and, and uh, that's in our hymnal. Even Amazing Grace, which purportedly was to a bar tune, I don't know if that's true or not, but you know, there's, there are songs in the hymnal that had their own share of um, controversy when they came out because of that, so. And instruments. And instruments, yes. I, I was just thinking of like the memorizational component of music, you know, like, you know, you can memorize a song will come on a radio and you know like every word to it. It's like the same thing with the hymns, like an old hymn that I maybe sang as a kid, like, start playing like I know every word to it and so it's like, like there's that component to it so as a child or anybody in church learning a hymn or singing a song sticks with you and so if you're singing good song like you know doctrinal songs then you're, you're learning biblical truths yeah Dustin's exactly right and it's a double edged thing because for some people music just activates that memory component and a few Wednesday, a month or so ago, Marty or somebody said something about a, an old country song, and they quoted a line from it, and I was able, oh, I know that song, let me sing it, I sang it the whole, like, three verses, because my dad listened to country music, and it's stuck in there. If it was pre-70s, I probably know it, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but the same is true with him. Um, now... The distressing thing is, is the older I get, the more I find, and if I have to leave music sometimes, you'll see the struggle up there right before you. I used to be able to sing most of the old hymns without even looking at the hymnal, and now I think I can, but I'll get the words wrong. But part of it is so the, words the words are, are different in different hymnals. Yes. Yeah. On that note, can we please put the real word back to blessed be the name? That's the, the Yeah, Donna. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, three is acceptable. Okay, well, that was a bad uh, example. 
Which is more important, Donna, Father, Son, or Holy Spirit? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Donna! <laughs> Uh, so that, that's the reason. I think that's something that Roger started years ago, or who just can, I don't know if it was Roger or not, but he went at every verse be, because of the, what, it, what it told. And um, hopefully we, we are thinking through the, the hymn and the words and we're, we're worshiping the Lord in that. Um, because again, sometimes, you know, it gets mundane. Yeah, it's as in some some uh, hymns, it was Roger because he liked a particular hymn. Mostly, it was me because I, I just love hymns, and it's yeah, you can blame me. Um, uh, and so, I especially the hymns I really like. Uh, it's hard for me. It was always hard for me to cut a hymn out or cut a verse out, but. Uh, I was going to say something else, but I don't remember what. I'm sorry, Don. <laughs> oh. Uh, but then there are others that we, we don't sing near as many as there are. I mean, Amazing Grace has, it's either 16 or 18 stanzas in the original that here that uh, was originally written. So, so be thankful. <laughs> I do think it's worth revisiting sometime, whether it's in here or at some point, just to talk more about music, because it is important. When we, with COVID, quit doing the offertory, one of the things I asked them to do is to continue to have that instrumental, um, because I think music is, part of its intent is uh, to prepare us for receiving the word of God, put us in it. For lack of a better word, to put us in a contemplative mood, um, and so I think uh, even instrumental music. I think sometimes we, well, I don't know what song that is, and uh, and again, if you don't know what song, let's go ask them afterwards. And say, what was that song you played? And then go look at the words if it was an instrumental, um, because I think it's pur it is purposeful. We don't just arbitrarily do things. I was going to talk a little bit about that this morning, and then somebody asked, why won't we have crosses everywhere? And I couldn't think of the purposeful reason why we don't, so I abandoned ship on that today. But most things are are purposeful, although I do think the purpose was probably was cheaper. But uh, but JC is right. Part of that was Roger, too. But anyway, I know we're out of time, but uh, we'll talk about that some more in the future. We'll talk more about music. Well, thank you guys for being uh, willing to answer all these questions. Um, I am thankful that we have all the questions so far. Uh, I do have a few more, but if you have any other questions, please send them my way, um, and I will get them put in. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Uh, JC, do you mind closing us this morning? Well, this morning as we uh, get ready to conclude this class, that to learn more about uh, our pastors, Father, that we learn more about you because of them. And we thank you for their willingness to devote themselves to the word. And, Father, that they might be an example to us to uh, follow after you, to seek answers to life in your word, because the answers are there if we just look. And, Father, I just again thank you for this place that we can come together and fellowship around your word, that we can have fellowship with one another, that uh, we can be an encouragement to each other as uh, we start our week here at church. And I just uh, thank you for giving us this place. And it's in Christ's name, I pray. Amen.